Welcome to the retirement ceremony in which Major General Jason Q. Bohm, Inspector General of the Marine Corps, will retire from the United States Marine Corps after 34 years of honorable and faithful service. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the invocation given by Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Schwinn's United States Air Force Reserve and remain standing for the national anthem and honors to Major General Powers and Major General Bohm. I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather this morning to celebrate the retirement of Major General Jason Bohm and to recognize the role he and his family have played in the defense of our nation. Yesterday was Easter, and Christians celebrated Jesus rising from the dead to offer new life. May the timing of this retirement be anchored in that hope. For though the end of a career can feel like a death of sorts, may it also bring a resurrection and a new beginning for Jason and Sonia. As General Baum looks back on 34 years of service, may you fill him with memories of missions accomplished and the Marines he led and loved. From Somalia to Haiti, from the hills of West Virginia to work on Capitol Hill, from Iraq to Bahrain, from Portugal to Quantico, for command at every level. May you look upon the work he has done and the way he has done it with favor. As he takes off his uniform for the final time, may you remind him of who he is underneath it. Without stars on his shoulder or an eagle globe and anchor at his neck, remind him of his dignity, worth, and value as a son of God, a position from which he will never retire or be reassigned. As we prepare to return this man to Sonia, Ashley, Ethan, and Emily, with gratitude for their sacrifice as well, I ask, would you fill them with an overwhelming sense of hope and expectation? Because the God who has seen them through the challenges of the past promises a new life and a future to all those who trust in him. I ask this now, in the name of Christ, my Lord. Amen. Amen. Jason Q. Bohm, having served faithfully and honorably, was retired from the United States Marine Corps on the 1st day of April, 2024. Signed, E. M. Smith, General, United States Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. From the President of the United States, Certificate of Appreciation for Service in the Armed Forces of the United States of America, 
Major General Jason Q. Baum, United States Marine Corps, I extend my personal gratitude and the sincere appreciation of a grateful nation to you for your patriotic service to our country. Your bravery and dedication in our armed forces helped protect your fellow Americans during a critical moment in our history and contributed to a world of greater security and growing prosperity. Your devotion to duty, honor, and country in keeping with the long traditions of the finest military in the world embodied the American ideal of selfless service. Our nation owes you an incredible debt. Your commitment and the example you set will inspire future generations to serve with pride and to keep our country secure. You represent the best of our nation, and I join our fellow Americans in saluting your honorable service. I wish you happiness and success in your next chapter. Signed, the Honorable J.R. Biden, Commander-in-Chief. A message from the Commandant of the Marine Corps. For General Bone, Jason, you have been a gift to our Corps. We are all better off for serving alongside you. Trisha and I wish you and Sonia the very best in retirement. Again, all I can say is thank you. Semper Fidelis, E. M. Smith. At this time, Major General Bone will receive a flag as a token of appreciation for faithful and honorable service to a grateful nation. In honor of Major General Bone's 34 years of dedicated service to this country and passion as a historian, this flag was flown over the U.S. Marine Corps War Memorial and subsequently flown by the Washington Crossing Historic Park over the graves of the Continental Army soldiers who perished during the December 1776 encampment at the Thompson Neely House and surrounding properties in the township. The park manager, Mr. Mike Couser, and the museum curator, Ms. Kimberly McCarty, thank you for your service and convey their best wishes for a long and fruitful retirement. Certificate of Appreciation. The Commandant of the Marine Corps takes pleasure in presenting the certificate to Sonia M. Baum. In grateful appreciation of your unselfish, faithful, and devoted support of your husband's military career, your continuous encouragement and understanding helped to make possible Jason's last contribution to the Marine Corps. We fully realize that your perseverance and understanding were not provided without hardship and sacrifice during his tours of duty. Signed, Eric M. Smith, General. U.S. Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. It is my pleasure to introduce our retiring officer for today's ceremony, Major General William J. Bowers. Well, good morning, Lieutenant General Beerman, Lieutenant General Anderson, Lieutenant General Martin, General Officers, Marines, friends, families of the Bone family. Thank you all for coming out for this very special occasion to honor the service of a truly remarkable uh, American family and a battle buddy I've had the great blessing to be best friends with for the past 34 years. You know, Jason's left us with a book called From the Cold War to Isola, that talks about his achievements and what life has been like growing up in the Marine Corps. And all of us have been a part of this journey with him. What I'd like to do is just provide about 15 minutes of context for everything this Marine and his family have done for our, for our Corps and our country over the past 33 years. And as we see with Jason, we're not talking about what Jason's done, but more importantly, who he is like the chaplain said in the prayer. I think you, we see three themes emerge in everything Jason's done. Courage, every type of courage, physical, moral, mental, spiritual, selflessness, 
puts his family, his fellow Marines, the mission, everyone else first but himself, and faithfulness. Faithfulness to God, the country, the Corps, his Marines, his friends. We're going to see these throughout the past 34 years in what's truly been a remarkable journey. And me and my Fox Company TBS mates know because we were there from the start of it. It really starts back in June 1990. Uh, Bohm and Bowers were put together as TBS roommates. <laughs> and, you know, I think Jason had got there a little earlier than me. And they made Jason the Fox Company first sergeant. So Jason was in charge as we're all forming and storming there. Jason is responsible for keeping accountability and getting us through uh, the first week of processing and forming. And I had the great fortune to be the first platoon, a platoon sergeant. So we're roommates there, and I'm hoping I'm going to get some slack from my TBS roommate <laughs> as I report all present and see other people running into the back of the formation. And, but I knew right away where I said, hey, Billy, got to get the numbers, got to be accurate, man. I think Barrett was you with. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to join the formation. And then, you know, we started TBS together. And remember our first week, uh, this was the gray era, right? And it's all about FMF and one war fighting. So we had all read it and reread it. And we're having these platoon discussions about war fighting. It's just all the rage. And then that weekend, they popped a surprise test on us. And it was about a 20 page packet on the Battle of Austerlitz. And it was written by Dr. David Chandler. And I'm like, man, this is great. David Chandler was one of my professors at VMI. So all the VMI guys are like, hey, we, we took this. We're going to do just fine. And then it had 10 surprise, 10 questions. Write an essay and answer either one, each one of these. Jason had never had Dr. Chandler, but what, about a third of the company failed the test. <laughs> we, a bunch of us had to retake it. There was one lieutenant who scored a near perfect score and none of the SPCs had ever seen that before. He got like a 98.5. And it wasn't me who had Dr. Chandler at VMI. It was Jason. <laughs> right, right out of the gates, first weekend at TBS, Jason aces the maneuver warfare test. And we're like, well, all right. And the truth is, he just never looked back. And all of us who were blessed to be friends with Jason, Right, we're just made better by just being around him. So we're going through TBS, and then we're taking some, you know, some of us are thinking we're still gonna compete with this guy, and I'm trying, to, and then we get to land nav. Land nav's the great humbling experience of TBS, and a bunch of us bolo it. So we gotta start showing up for remedial land nav on Saturday morning, and who's also showing up with us to get better at? Jason. Jason, then, Jason, you got 100 on this. No, I mean, I just want to get better at it. I just love it. And Jason, well, hey, can, can you help me? Because I, 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 I got to be here. Some of us back there all. So Jason helps us. But then as Jason starts coming, remember, he was coming every Saturday. You know, JJ, all the other guys, like, everyone starts coming. And, you know, we were herds turds. And they had third squad, which was up there, right? First platoon. Then you start seeing Matt Cooper and JJ, all of us. I'm like, first platoon, like half of our platoon is going out there doing that because you just want to get good at it. And that's really what Jason does. He makes everyone around him better. All of us got better by being friends uh, with Jason. Of course, he finished number one at TBS. I don't think none of us were even close, right? He, uh, elects to be an infantry officer, goes to IOC, and this is when Desert Storm is going on. And uh, Jason's disappointed that he missed it. A lot of us lieutenants. We're disappointed that we missed it, but not to worry. There's plenty of work for Jason to do out there. He gets out there, he joins 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, deploys to Okinawa almost right away with 3rd Platoon. I remember seeing Jason and Sonia. They got married at TBS. I saw them before going over to Hawaii. They had a little apartment there in Carlsbad, and Jason was off. And Sonia was a Marine wife right from the start uh, in the fleet, <coughs> alone out there in California, uh, figuring out how to make it work and how to take care of the spouses of Jason's Marines. Jason comes back from a second, a successful deployment to Okinawa. And then, this is the uh, early 90s, Operation Restore Hope. Jason gets command of the 81's platoon. You know, the 81's were an unruly bunch in 3-9 at the time. They figured if there's anyone can square them away, 
It's Jason. So Jason takes command 81s, squares them away, and then they go to Somalia for Operation Restore Hope. They call themselves Bones Bastards because he uh, actually does get them squared away. And this is this is in the era of you know the three block war. General Krulak would call this the three block war, where in three city blocks you can separate warring tribes, you can see a high intensity combat, and you can provide humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. Jason leads the 81 platoon with Tim Winer on his flank at the heavy guns platoon, working for a guy named Padilla, Fred Padilla, through a brilliant, brilliant deployment through Operation Restore Hope, where he's faced with about every type of complex tactical scenario a young lieutenant could face, and he handles them all brilliantly. The only questionable decision throughout this Somalia deployment is Jason made the call to bed his platoon down in a field filled with Somali uh, pancakes, which is kind of like sewage. Now, this is from an engineer who's made my share of crappers and base camps. <laughs> <laughs> it was pitch black out. It's black. <laughs> It's black, right? <laughs> Jason leads the platoon through Restore Hope brilliantly. He comes back, does another deployment to Okinawa, and then he gets orders to the Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Company. So Jason moves Sonia. They go across country, checks in at Norfolk. They have Ashley at this time, and right away, Jason gets sent off to Haiti. I think Jason and his Marines had to pretend they were students, right? Because Marines weren't allowed in the country and allowed to wear, have weapons. Jason goes down there, reinforces the embassy, comes back after a successful mission. Kobar Towers gets blown up in the Middle East, so Fast Company is off again to provide security at Menini Plaza in Bahrain. Accomplishes that mission, comes back, and then he's back to Haiti with his platoon for Operation Uphold Democracy. And it's in 1977, when Jason is selected for the Advanced Infantry Officer Course. Now, his first seven years in the Marine Corps, he's done six deployments while married with a child at home. And another, in Ethan, is either soon to be born or on the way. He goes to the Infantry Officer Advanced Course, again, honor graduate just like TBS, ends up out of Camp Pendleton in 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. Jason and I both got to the fleet around the same time. We started as assistant operations officers and then got command of our companies. Jason got Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. And I remember being really excited when we found out my engineer company was going to go to CACS to support Jason's battalion. So this is going to be great. We're going to be working together. And we're seeing each other out there. So Jason has the Hilo company. And he's getting ready to do the helicopter assault course. So I'm talking to my lieutenants. And uh, we have an engineer plan for, you know, we're going to advise Jason how to employ a, a common engineer. So, so I go up to Jason's tent, the Fox Company. You're, you know what's coming, right? So I go up there and see Jason in his tent. He's in there with Jason Perry. He's like, said, hey, Jason, hey, I wanted to talk to you about uh, how you can employ your engineers uh, for the Helo Assault Force. Oh, Bill, you mean like this? And he pulls out the map. He's got the blocking obstacles, the turning, the disrupting, <laughs> where the tank ditch is going. Far better than the engineer could have done. <laughs> it's Jason, right? We, we, this is Jason. You mean like this, Billy? Does this look good? Um, yeah, yeah. So I go back. The order to the lieutenant says, do exactly what Captain Bone tells you to do, right? <laughs> Hack is a success. Jason gives the credit, again, the selflessness. Gives credit to everyone else, makes everyone around him better. And then they're getting ready to do range 400. And Range 400 is kind of an infantry company commander's report card. And the last time Golf Company 2-1 had done Range 400, Emory had been shot. And Jason Perry, who was Jason's at the time, had talked about it because he was in the company at the time. He'd kind of been tarred with it. And Jason had planned on getting out of the Marine Corps. He, well, you know, sir, I had someone shot on the range, and I don't see much of a future for me, and, you know. But Jason's working with him. And then Sonia goes into labor with Emily. So I come back from the range, and there's a yellow sticky. You know, we used to do those. Uh, Captain Bowman wants to see me. So I go up, see Jason. He's in the tent there. It's pre-K span. Hey, Billy. Sonia's going into labor with Emily. I'm heading back. I said, Jason, you got range 400. This is in the gray Monday Krulak era, right? And we would all just quote FMFM1 
the best indication of what type of commander you are or how the unit, how the unit performs in your absence. I'm going to be with my family, you know, when Emily's getting born. So he puts it on Jason Perry to take Golf Company 2-1 through range 400. And of course, the selflessness, right? Jason has the company well-trained. Jason Perry takes him out of the range 400. The Coyote say it's one of the best runs they've seen. Jason comes back a week later. Emily's been born, sign is home, the company is doing great, didn't miss a beat. The addendum is, you know, Jason Perry had a change of heart after that. You know, went on to stay in the Marine Corps, became a Japanese FAO, made colonel, commanded the 4th Marines for Lieutenant General Beerman, the Shanghai Regiment in Okinawa, and is now the senior man at the Naval Postgraduate School, providing that same guidance, leadership, and mentorship to about 275 students undergoing training out there at Naval Postgraduate School. That, that's one example of the thousands of lives that Jason has touched. Jason comes back from CACS, it's obviously a great event, and the embassies get bombed in Kenya and Tanzania. So if you're Lieutenant Colonel Wagner, the battalion commander of 2-1, who are you going to send when the mission goes out? We've got to reinforce the embassy in Kenya. You got a company commander, his company has just excelled at CACs, he's got six deployments under his belt already, he's got fast experience, sure enough, Gulf 2-1 gets the call, Jason's company is in Kenya, reinforcing embassy security in Kenya. He links up with the MU, completes a MU deployment, and around this time, uh, in the fall of 98, the MAR admin goes out asking for nominations for the Leftwich Trophy. And the Leftwich Trophy is known as the best infantry company commander, really combat arms company commander in the Marine Corps. And all of us captains, you know, they didn't really even a competition. We know who it's going to be. And it's no surprise that Jason is the winner of the 1998 uh, Luffwich Trophy. General Krulak comes out to present the award there at First Marines headquarters. Colonel Paxson is the regimental commander. And there was kind of a cruel joke going around the Corps at the time, like, yeah, it's great you get that Luffwich Trophy, but be careful. <laughs> Because there's a set of orders taped underneath that drill. <laughs> with, orders, with orders to the worst recruiting station in the country. Right? It happened to Dale Offrey's in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, before that, Jeff Kenny is in RS Pittsburgh. This is around the time that Dave Furness is getting smoke jump into RS Sacramento. So Jason goes up to get the trophy from General Krulak and Colonel Paxton. Looks under. <laughs> orders ain't there. Gets the trophy, brings it home. Orders to Marine Corps Command Staff College. Selected for major, but before we send in the command staff college, let's see if we can get another deployment out of him. This is around the Kosovo is going on. We need his expertise in Kosovo. They thought they needed his expertise as an individual augment before the Corps was really providing those. Jason gets over there to fill a major's billet. Finds out there's a lieutenant colonel who wants to get out of there and go take command. And yeah, Jason, you're not going to fill that major's billet. We're going to fill you for you in here to fill the senior lieutenant colonel J-5 build to help plan the O-plan, steel anvil. So Jason helps do another O-plan for a JTF as part of the Kosovo contingency. When he's paroled and he gets back, moves the family, all three kids now, back to Quantico for command and staff college. So Jason's at command and staff. He's loving it. He jumps into his thesis. He's going to do about Marines, how we've got to prepare to fight this three-block war. But those devils at manpower <laughs> have figured out, you know, we know that they got on the whisk of taping the orders underneath the Leftwich Trophy. Let's just put those orders in a drawer for now. <laughs> Let's get him back here, think he's safe at Command and Staff College, and then we'll hit him when he's writing the paper and can't fight about it. Can't. <laughs> sure enough, Jason's writing his thesis, and then boom, orders. Charleston, West Virginia. Well, wait, wait a minute, did I get a chance? Yeah, you're going to Charleston, West Virginia. So for three years, Jason was sent out there to recruiting duty in Charleston, West Virginia. It was the hardest recruiting station uh, in the country. The fourth district was the toughest district for recruiting in the country. That was the time of the ramp up to the OIF war. It was a very challenging time. The best war fighters at the Corps were commanding recruiting stations. 
in the 4th Marine Corps District. Lieutenant General Donovan was up in Harrisburg, General Beerman was in Richmond, General Journey was in Baltimore, and General Bohm was in Charleston, West Virginia. And he did get reinforcements, did not get the support, but gutted it out and made it. And what he really grew in this tour was his faith uh, in God, right? And got a great community out there in West Virginia, became part of a great little church, and grew in his faith and in his love of the Corps. After three very tough years, um, you know, Jason and I were out there together. He was time to go back to the fleet in 2004. So where do you want to go? So I got to get back. I got to get regreened. Where are you going? Well, then go be the XO for First Battalion, First Marines, for a guy named uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Furness. I said, all right, well, Jason. Uh, so you know, Dave Furness is not a shrinking violet. <laughs> You're not a shrinking violet. <laughs> I, I, you know, hey, here's where I'm going. We're going to get a deployment. So Jason goes out there and is the echo <coughs> uh, for Dave Furness on 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. Loves working for him. The battalion does amazing things. They provide humanitarian assistance, disaster relief for the tsunami in Indonesia when the giant wave hits there. They go up into Baghdad. They go up into the Middle East. The MU gets tasked to provide security from southern Baghdad down to Babil. So Jason, with 1-1, Dave Furness in the lead, they go and they provide security for southern Baghdad in a very, very tough time. Jason is selected for lieutenant colonel. The MU comes back, another successful deployment. But now Jason is a lieutenant colonel select, and he can't stay in 1st Battalion, 1st Marine. So what do they do with him? They send him to the division staff. Well, Blue Diamond staff, but hey, Blue Diamond's getting ready to go and redeploy back to Iraq and take over from TUMAF. So who do we send over to set conditions for a successful transition from 2MEF to 1MEF? Right back into the mix. So we send Jason back to Iraq. So now he's the current operations officer in the division. He's working for 2nd Mardiv as 2MEF leaves. As 1MEF comes in, this is Lieutenant General Zilmer, General Neller, new command coming in, and Jason just makes it all go seamlessly, smoothly, and does yet another a combat tour. He gets to come back. He is selected, slated to command 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. So he can't stay in Iraq for the full year. He's got to come back and take this battalion and get them ready to go. Either on his way back or shortly after he gets back, he learns that the battalion's deployment has been accelerated by four months. So he's going to have to really do an accelerated timeline to get the deployment ready. This has been the surge in Iraq. I mean, he's done nine, this is, this is eight deployments, six combat real-world contingency deployments. So Jason's running through the Camp Pendleton training areas, trying to find out where he can train his Marines, where he can make the best use of every square piece of dirt out there in Camp Pendleton to get his battalion ready, and he's bit by a rattlesnake. Now, you know, you're not going to get through eight deployments, two combat tours in Iraq, and come back and get bit by a rattlesnake? And dance. <laughs> <laughs> well then, you know, Jason's not going to go to the duty and say, hey, call an ambulance, not the future battalion commander. I'm going to get, I got to get myself to the hospital. Uh, he gets himself there, get a Marines, he gets up to the hospital, he gets the drugs, calls son, hey, got bit by a rattlesnake, bring me some, some books, I got to do some studying while I'm late up in the hospital. <laughs> and son brings in the books. He takes 1st Battalion, 4th Marines to Iraq, uh, he gets to the area of Alkine. He's learned from one of the best warfighters we have, uh, Dale Lauford, who's really, Dale Lauford and Dave Furness kind of showed how it can be done over there. Takes Alkine, continues the great work that Alfred has done. General Beerman is on his flank there in Haditha. And you know, years later, um, I'm in the living room of Lieutenant General uh, Stacy Clarity, who was the 3MF commander. And, you know, about once a month on a Sunday afternoon, I was the MCI PAC commander, he was the MEF commander. He would have me up and we'd just talk about three MEF business, MCI PAC business uh, in his living room right there over a beer. And he had just finished a whole bunch of fitness reports, and fitness reports um, were on his mind. And he says, yeah, you know, I've just been in fit rep hell all day. I just wrapped up about 30 of them. I got a few more to do, but, you know, have you done yours yet? Start talking about it about the profile, and then he says, you know, um, 
I've been very careful with how I've managed my profile uh, over the years. And I'm very proud to say that my battalion commanders in combat are still at the top of my profile. They're the best I've seen. And this is from the 3 MEF commander. And he, he, he rattled off who they were. And Jason Bone was one of them. One of the other ones was commanding the 3rd Division out there for General Clarity. That's what the commander of 2nd Marines thought of one of his battalions coming from 1st Marines in combat for what Jason did over there. But again, the selflessness, right, and the faithfulness. Jason had engaged with the Sheikhs, and he was working with the locals out there, but when one of the mayors was disappointed that he didn't get face time, but when he was President Bush, Jason said, oh, don't worry, Major Farwan. The Sheikh got to see George Bush. You're going to get to see Mickey Mouse. Like, what? He's like, we're going to get you back to Southern California, get you to meet Mickey Mouse and see Disney. And Jason worked for years at it with his partner, City of Laguna Niguel, with Nick Morano, and got Major Farwan back to Southern California because that's how much he cared and his selflessness. Comes back from 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, gets selected to go to the Naval War, uh, National War College, is the honor graduate of the National War College, ends up in the J-5 as the executive assistant for uh, first Admiral Winnefeld and then uh, General Jacoby. And you know, I was right behind Jason at National War College, and then I ended up in the J-5. Jason may have had something to do with that. But, uh, but one morning, uh, it was interesting, one morning, it was a Monday morning, uh, I get a call from, uh, from Jason saying, hey, hey Billy, the uh, J-5 wants to see you. I said, all right, should I get uh, the colonel and yeah, no, 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 just, just you, just me. Am I in trouble? Just get down here. <laughs> so I went down there, and Jason and I are in there, and it's General Jacoby. Let's get the hat. So Jason and I are sitting up to the and General Jacoby's at the front. And he says, yeah, the, uh, this is General Jacoby. I said, the chairman has just come back from travel with the CAG. And uh, he, he says the CAG is going to write the national military strategy and the chairman's risk assessment because uh, they got uh, his voice. The documents need to stay here. We're going to do those in the five. He says, us guys, we've been on the ground. We know what it's like. And Jason's like, sir, we'll take care of it. We'll enable and facilitate the CAG's success. We will get the documents here and produce them as the five should, and as the doctrine should. And sure enough, through some of those Byzantine, you know, lanes up there at the Pentagon, Jason maneuvered, made friends with everybody, the five ended up publishing both documents and more to come. The CAG director ended up going to Jason for help, what, in eight months, so he could become the civilian deputy, J5 himself, and again, the selflessness Jason made everyone around him uh, better. And he did it without seeking any credit for himself. Moral courage, selflessness, faithfulness. So when he's done with his time in the five, Jason really wants to get back to the fleet. He's itching to get back to the fleet. This is when Afghanistan is going on. He's like, I just want to get back to the 1st Marine Division. And uh, the assistant comment at the time is a guy named General Dunford. He says, nah, you know, you we're not going to say, we're not going to let you out of D.C. yet. Um, we need you to be the Marine Corps liaison to the House of Representatives. So General Dunford selects Jason to be part of the Office of Legislative Affairs, the Marine Corps rep for OLA. Knowing General Dunford like we all do, General Dunford thinks ahead, and he probably knew 5th Marines, my old regiment, is going to be screened next summer. I have a good idea who would be a great commander for 5th Marines. Uh, sure enough, Jason does two years up there in the House of Representatives. He is selected to command 5th Marines, and he takes the family back out to Camp Pendleton uh, one more time. Except this time, it's not just going to be a straight like 5th Marine Regiment. Jason is going to stand up the first Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force Crisis Response in Central Command. So he has four bosses now. He's working for the Division Commander, the MEF Commander, the Marine Corps Installations West Commander, because Jason's the San Mateo Commander, and the Mars Scent Commander. Jason stands up, Special Purpose MACTAC, deploys them to the Middle East, 
And then he deploys with a contingent into Iraq to support the joint fight against ISIL. This is 12 total deployments, 10, 10 combat contingency real world uh, deployments. Comes back, selected for, to be the director of Expedition Warfare School. And while, as he's the director of EWS, he's selected to no one's surprise, uh, the Brigadier General. And when General Dunford turned over command, had the passage of commandancy to General Neller, General Dunford talked about what General Bohm, what Jason had done with 5th Marines out at the Special Purpose MAGTAF. So, Jason's at Quantico, he takes command of Training Command, 18 Colonel Commands distributed all over the United States. It is a tough beast to get a hold of. This is also at the time when women, the direct ground combat exclusion rule is being lifted, so Jason has to do all the standards for the basic school and make sure every, the integration goes exceptionally well, there's institutional risk at stake, and Jason handles it all brilliantly. He gets selected for joint duty, he goes over to Strike Forces NATO, does two years over there, helps square NATO away, it's a Navy command, gets them squared away, and then gets selected to come back uh, to be the Commanding General of Marine Corps Recruiting Command, except the one challenge this time is not going to Charleston, West Virginia, and not taking over the worst artists in the country, but he's taking Marine Corps Recruiting Command at the height of COVID, when the high schools were all locked down. Jason takes command from his flank man from out there in Iraq, General Beerman, continues the success, and the Marine Corps is the only service to make it during Jason's tenure and ever since for what he's done as a commanding general in the Marine Corps Recruiting Command. After turning over to me, his former TBS roommate and gets selected to be the Inspector General uh, of the Marine Corps. In everything he has done, courage, physical, moral, spiritual, doing the right thing for the right reasons, selflessness, making everyone around him better, faithfulness, truly epitomizing Semper Fidelis to his Marines, to his family, to God, to the country, to the core. Everything he's done. Courage, selflessness, faithfulness. And, you know, he's also found some time to make some other contributions as well. You know, we got two books here that he wrote. <clears throat> From the Cold War to ISIL was a great journey that just will bring a smile to your face. And Washington's Marines, his latest book, just won the Francis Tavern Award for the best book of the year, and it's up for another book award currently. But you know, he hasn't done it alone. He's done it with a supportive and loving family. And, and Sonia, uh, thank you for loaning Jason to us for 34 years. 12 deployments, 10 combat deployments, raising three children, you have truly uh, done it all. Our nation owes you an enormous debt. Mm -hmm. For Ashley, and Ethan, and Emily, watching you grow up, you know, seeing you just know your parents are so proud of the children you've become. You know, Emily, you brought smiles to our family's faces when we were in Okinawa and locked down and our family was imploding in there and we got a message from you, can you bring Christmas presents for the girls? I just came over and played with the girls for the afternoon. And Ethan, I know your dad's so proud of you, and Ashley, it's so great to see you again. Your family has given more than can be expected, more than can be asked to this country, to the Marine Corps. And our nation, our Corps, and all of us who've been blessed to be Jason's friend, who are better because of our friendship with him, owe you an enormous debt, an enormous thank you for loaning him to us. So, on behalf of all the Marines whose lives you've touched, to have our core, our country, thank you all very, very much. God bless you. Semper Fidelis. <laughs>
this time, I would like to introduce Miss Bone. no use of pomp or prop in the fight, distractions that seek only to appeal, encumbrances restraining honor-clad movements that require no apology, not theirs to promote ideologies of any one or other faction, glad to make use of might and main for a cause lofty in purpose, sworn to support and defend that which seeks a virtuous end, liberty and peace through a supreme law. Citizens are born, but patriots made. Inspired by selfless acts, exemplified by those who chose to put the full cup by, so others may find rest within the shade. Sing to your, sing to your daughters and sons songs of hope, optimistic odes, patriotic verse, Build resiliency as they rehearse lines for the time it will be theirs to cope, theirs to move and to breathe and to decide. Weave strong fibers into their tapestry. Motivate them to noble ministry. In such and in their God, they will abide. Thank you all for being here. You share in our story. We love you and I'm forever grateful. all sunshine in my day, all right? <laughs> and it's because of you. So thankful to have all of you here, General Beerman, General Anderson, General Martin, Admiral Miller, oh, Sergeant Major and Pam, you made it, slipped in on me. Excellent to see you. Sergeant Major Wiggins, Sergeant Major Scott, General Lukeman, Miss Garrison, uh, SES Shelton, and Adams, General Bowers, my dear friend, and all of you. Thank you so much for joining us and honoring us today uh, with, your with your presence. I also want to recognize uh, all of the other Sergeants Majors, if I missed any of you, and the Master Gunnery Sergeants in the audience. I know there's at least two now, right? One now. Uh, okay. I guess someone had to go. Okay, I, I also want to uh, personally thank General Lukeman and the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation Thank you so much for the beautiful venue 
and for all the support uh, for us today in being able to be here. Thank you for helping to preserve our rich history and tradition of our poor. I want to thank the band. Excellent music as always. Thank you so much. Uh, Stratcom, where are you at? Strategic Communications, we're filming things and uh, taking uh, pictures. And I want to thank my home team, the uh, Inspector General team, for all that they have done to be able to uh, make this event happen today. Thank you so much. A special thank you to our chaplain, uh, Pastor Jeff Schlins, who is our uh, pastor at City Gates Church. And Jeff, would you stand up for a minute, please? So you'll recognize the fact that he's a fine looking Air Force officer. <laughs> but what I also want you to understand is that he's a former Marine Staff Sergeant. Oh, wow. Wow. Thank you. And it's fitting today that we have Pastor Jeff with us because as you have all heard earlier, uh, we also had the distinct pleasure as luck would have it, that my daughter's number did hit and we'll be able to promote her to Staff Sergeant directly following this ceremony. So that Staff Sergeant connection there. And let me tell you, I could not be happier. So thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, as I stated, we will do the ceremony. The way it's going to work is I will make my comments. We'll finish this part of the ceremony. I understand some of you may have to go back to work. We're gonna change uniform get to know each other a little bit better. We're gonna walk down this uh, trail right here to the Molly Marine statue, which is a female Marine statue, and we're gonna do uh, our daughter's promotion down there. And we would be very honored if you could all join us for that. And I also want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I apologize for the fact that this is the day after Easter, and I know some of you had to travel on Easter, I apologize because I know, because Lee let me know, <laughs> that, uh, that the plane tickets are much more expensive right now because it is a holiday weekend, And uh, but you know, you really do uh, honor us by your presence today. And Sonia and I would like to sit here and recognize every single one of you and talk about how you touched our hearts over the years, but we just simply don't have enough time to do that. So if we could, uh, after the ceremony and during the reception, uh, we would love to be able to engage with you individually and thank you for your time and for your support all of these years. On that final admin note, the reception, receptions traditionally are held in the museum and I encourage everyone, if you haven't had the opportunity to go through the museum, it really is a pilgrimage for all Marines. However, we're not doing a reception here today. We're gonna to do it at Milano's Family Restaurant in Springfield, Virginia, which is about 30 minutes up to 95. And the reason we're doing that very simply is because we want to support some local businessmen. And uh, you know, all the restaurants uh, got hit pretty hard during COVID, and this, this is kind of our go-to place in our, uh, in our neighborhood, and so we want to show our support for the locals. And I know General Lukeman's got all kinds of money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before I begin my comments today, I, I really first want to take a moment to acknowledge and to thank God. Okay, because not only for all that he's done for all of us, and for my family specifically, but perhaps even more importantly, for the challenges and the struggles that he has placed in my life. Because I know, and it took me several years to figure this out, that I had grown much more during those trials of life than I ever did when things were going well. And I thank God for that opportunity. I also want to thank my family right up front. So all of you in the room know when you heard from, uh, from General Bauer some of the challenges of being in a military family, the lost friendships, the sacrifices that are made, the moves. It all takes a toll on the family. Uh, but I would argue that it also builds character and it builds resiliency. And Sonia and I love our kids dearly. We couldn't be happier with the people that they have become, the talents that they are using and following their passions and becoming good citizens in our great nation. But of course, as Bill said, none of this is possible 
without this strong, independent, brave, resilient woman that you see sitting before you today. So my wife, Sonia, truly is my best friend, and I love her dearly. Now, I'll be honest with you, it isn't always rosy, okay, but, you know, that's my fault, not hers. But all joking aside, now, Sonia and I have been together for 37 years, okay, longer than I've been in the Marine Corps. She has been with me every step of the way that Bill very uh, thankfully shared. And I can tell you that I cannot ask for a more supportive, loving, or caring partner, or loving parent, and supporting parent than Sonia. And like God, uh, Sonia has not always given me what I wanted, <laughs> but she has always given me what I needed. And I'm very grateful for that, and there's not a person in the world that I look forward to spending the rest of my life with. I love you. I also love the Marine Corps. Okay, in fact, I was, uh, my mother still has a scrapbook with a letter in it that says, Dear Jason, thank you for your interest in the Marine Corps, but seeing as though you're only 12 years old, we can't help you right now. <laughs> True story. I still even have the iron on that they send along with it. Now, little did I know that I would become that recruiter man later that sent that letter. But uh, all joking aside, the true story, uh, you know, I have wanted to be a Marine for quite a long time. And the advice that I received from the recruiting station CEO at the time was to stay in school. So I did. And by doing that, and through the mentorship of some very wise and caring staff NCOs, staff non-commissioned officers, I stand before you today. So while contemplating what I wanted to talk about today, the answer became very clear to me. I am leaving the Marine Corps today with a happy heart. And I want to share with you why I love the Marine Corps. I love the Marine Corps first and foremost because of all of you. Because of every Marine sitting in this room, every Marine that I had the honor to serve with over these years, every Marine that went before us, and every Marine that's going to come after us. I love the Marine Corps because it's older than the country it defends. I love the Marine Corps because it was established in a bar, no doubt filled with ruffians, like many of you in the room today. And that culture has remained with us for 248 years. I love the Marine Corps because we jealously guard the rich history and traditions and we pass them down from generation to generation. I love the Marine Corps because no matter where we are in the world or what our circumstances are, we all celebrate the birth of our Corps every November 10th. I love the Marine Corps because we have the best damn uniforms in the world and <laughs> everyone knows it. I love the Marine Corps because we make and keep three promises to our great nation. We make Marines, we win battles, and we return good citizens to our communities. I love the Marine Corps because one has to earn the title Marine and every other thing that's worth gaining in the Corps. I love the Marine Corps because Marine recruiters continue to make mission during the most difficult time in Marine Corps recruiting history. I love the Marine Corps because the young people we attract and recruit join knowing full well that our boot camp and our officer cadet school is going to be longer and harder, that they are promised nothing, and that they will consistently be asked to do more with less. Yet they keep coming because they're selfless servants and willing to sacrifice all for the greater good. I love the Marine Corps because we follow a transformation process where all recruits and officer candidates are broken down as individuals and placed on an equal playing field where one's success is measured by the contribution they give to the team and not by their pedigree or their ethnicity or their gender. I love the Marine Corps because every day I get to serve with men and women of honor and character. I love the Marine Corps because we remain true to our brand of being tough, elite warriors, 
As other lower standards to better mesh with society, we understand that war is a dirty, nasty undertaking. We instill discipline, standards, and values in our people, and then we hold each other accountable for living up to them. Because failure to do so will lead to defeat on the battlefield. I love the Marine Corps because we exist to win our nation's battles, not wars. Our friends in the Army, Navy, and Air Force exist for that purpose, but we kick the door in and we kick the snot out of anybody that we need to to enable the other services. I love the ethos of the Marine Corps and that every Marine is a rifleman first and foremost, regardless of their military occupational specialty and every officer is a potential rifle platoon commander. History consistently proves the wisdom of this approach. I love the Marine Corps because when in civilian clothes and ask what do you do in the military, we don't respond with I'm a pilot, I'm a surface wear for our officer, or I'm a tanker. We reply simply, I am a Marine. I love the Marine Corps' war fighting doctrine that is as relevant today as it has been since it was first written several years ago. I love that Marines fight as Marine Air Ground Logistics Task Forces, which helps us to be self-mobile, self-sufficient, and self-supporting when necessary. And I can't tell you how many times that has proven true and played to our advantage in combat. I love that Marines are trendsetters and that historically we take the lead in developing innovative approaches towards fighting the next war and not worrying about fighting the last war. I love the Marine Corps because our Marines are flexible, adaptable problem solvers who train to understand that they can accomplish anything. Anything. There is no challenge too great, there is no obstacle too high that we cannot overcome, particularly when we work together as a team. I love the Marine Corps because we do windows. We do whatever the nation needs. More often than not, I found myself deployed on one mission only to have to quickly shift gears in order to do end all other missions as the president may direct. I love the Marine Corps because we love to fight. Unfortunately, this often occurs in peacetime, as often as war, but it is what it is. <laughs> I love the Marine Corps because we are not only the fiercest fighters in the world, we're also the most compassionate people that I know. I love the Marine Corps because we are mission focused. We always put mission first, even if it requires sacrifice. Unfortunately, oftentimes it does, whether that be on the battlefield or at home. I love the Marine Corps because we stand over the bodies of our fallen comrades. We show our respect, and then we get back in the fight until we achieve victory. But I also love the Marine Corps because we never, we never forget. Our fallen comrades. I love the Marine Corps because of our motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful to our God, to our country, and to our core. We're all brothers and sisters. I love the Marine Corps because the, date, the nation does not need a corps. We have an Army, a Navy, and an Air Force that can do everything that Marines do, and oftentimes, quite frankly, they do it better. But the nation wants a Marine Corps because of our unique culture and the strong conviction that Marines always get it done. I love the Marine Corps because we own our mistakes. We correct them, and then we move out smartly. I love the Marine Corps because even on our worst day, we can still say, I'm a Marine. I love the Marine Corps because once you earn the title Marine, it stays with you for life. 
And finally, I love the Marine Corps because the Corps lives on. Marines come and go, and today as I leave active duty, I proudly pass the torch on to my daughter Emily and to all the other Marines wearing our nation's cloth with great pride. I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve and will always remain Semper Fidelis. God bless you all. Bohm has made a donation to the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for anchors away from the Marine Hymn. Oh. 